Welcome, welcome, welcome to the Media Roundtable Podcast, Industry Edition. We are here in service of the Chief Audio Officer, that special individual who is responsible for the success of the marketing that they do using audio as a channel. And I am joined by a wonderful panel of thinkers and practitioners in the audio space. Uh, we have people that are uh, familiar to our listeners. We have James Ingrassia, Head of Account Services at Oxford Road. Welcome, James. Thank you. We have Kyle Jelinek, Vice President of Client Strategy at Oxford Road. Welcome, Kyle. Happy to be here. And from across the pond, we have uh, in his in his uh, place of origin, we have Giles Martin. Welcome, Giles. Thank you. Pleasure to be here. There's been some speculation on whether or not this is an AI Giles or a real Giles. He has blue lasers shooting out of his eyes uh, through his glasses, but you wouldn't know that unless you're consuming through YouTube, which apparently is a really big distribution channel uh, in podcasts. So um, here we are. I'm Dan Granger. I'm the CEO and founder of Oxford Road. I'm going to be your host on our tour this uh, afternoon or whatever time you're listening to it. We're going to go through about 100 different stories uh, in uh, the audio industry that we think that has some application to you. We'll see. We'll see. And uh, we do always welcome your feedback. Uh, info at MediaRoundTable.com. Feedback is the breakfast of champions. So tell us what you want more and less of as we go. Um, so we're. I'm not even going to preface because there's so much happening here. Um, but but let's start just breaking down some of the shorter stories uh, up top. So first things first. Uh, while you're you're uh, gallivanting as you so often do uh, across Europe, Giles, tell us what's happening uh, internationally based on the new Podscribe research. Well, um, they Podscribe have added, I think, around five or six hundred shows, from what I remember, in most of the um, well, not most of um, most of the hot markets, I would say, for podcasts. So. I believe they've got sort of Germany, the UK, Mexico, um, perhaps Canada, Australia. I don't know, Kyle may have a more comprehensive list of countries, but I just think it's a really interesting development that they've added these markets into their tool. The US has been, you know, such a gorilla compared to these other markets, um, which for the most part, you know, you're looking at combined market spends of probably hundred million dollars or less in any any one of the other international markets. But there's been so much news over the past six, 12, 18 months about international growth. I think particularly Latin America, uh, we're hearing a lot about now that rather stunning stat um, from a few months ago that I believe in 2025, the amount of podcast listeners in uh, South America will exceed the number in America and North America. So um, it makes a lot of sense that Podscribe are starting to put a bit more attention on this because I think the whole industry is. And for brands that have the ability to um, expand, you know, relatively easily into other markets, you know, we're already seeing a lot of success with that here. And, and it makes sense that the rest of the market will, will follow as well. And before we let Kyle jump in on this, Giles, can you just um, explain a little bit uh, more about like, why is it important that Podscribe uh, has released this data? What, what was the state of the information accessible before to a marketer who is looking to expand internationally? Um, the, 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 the tools just don't exist for international markets in the same way that they do in the US for, in podcasting. Um, and that really applies through the whole ecosystem, you know, for planning and research, um, for attribution. You know, there are just vastly fewer capabilities. Edison, for example, they have their podcast ranker and podcast metrics in the UK, um, but that's the only other market that's that's really served. So if you wanted to get any intel about international markets, it's a very manual process, uh, involves reaching out somewhat speculatively to um, you know, a lot of publishers who you may not know well, or you may not speak the language. So being able to go into one single interface and find out, you know, um, what type of competitive activity is going on in these shows and what type of, um, you know, shows are out there, you know, doing well currently is, is very helpful. I mean, you do have the Chartable and Rephonic charts, I should add, you know, they're there. Um, but again, it's, it's a pretty limited data set. And, um, you know, we're seeing a, an evolution and an enriching of, of that data. And it's it's great to see for international marketers. Yeah. And I was just going to say, I mean, Dan, you and I were talking earlier today, actually, about this is, you know, with some of the limitations with 
Spa and some of our other um, partners in the pixel tracking space, Podscribe is quickly becoming uh, kind of the leading partner in this, uh, especially when it comes to international. Um, being independent, I think a lot more publishers are willing to work with them and share their data. And just seeing this kind of research come out of them uh, just further solidifies their importance in the marketplace. It's an international concern, isn't it? And uh, does anybody just uh, pop quiz, does anybody know how much business um, there is internationally for podcast uh, relative to the United States? If I had to make an estimate, I would say the, the US is about 50% of the rest of the world is about 50%. That's what I was going to say. Same. Well, and, and I can't even tell you the actual, actual, what, what I can tell you is if you look at all audio revenues uh, between, you know, the three, the, the three big legs of the stool, right, our terrestrial radio, uh, streaming audio and podcast. And if you look at that domestically, you're, you're at about an $18 billion advertising business. You do that internationally, you're about 36. So you figure... Uh, Half the market is outside of the U.S., give or take. Uh, and if you're able to do business internationally, uh, why aren't you there? Uh, let's talk. And uh, definitely uh, good for Pete for putting that out there. Uh, let's keep moving, shall we? Uh, I've got the next story uh, that I'm going to introduce to you. <clears throat> it was uh, our friends at uh, Vanity Fair who wrote a nice uh, article about how VCs are using podcasts to lure in founders. Uh, but basically, it goes through and drops a lot of names, people that we uh, know and have spoken to on this show. Jason Kalkanis is maybe the lead player uh, spoken of in the article. Uh, but uh, Andreessen Horowitz, uh, Sequoia's gotten involved, Reed Hoffman, Bill Gurley, Jared Kushner, a lot of different people uh, in the financial sector have gotten into podcast. And I think sometimes we have to ask ourselves, okay, why is it attracting um, people that are, you know, this affluent or deal with this much money? They're probably not going to make a lot of money from the ad supported opportunity here. Uh, you know, if you want to, if you want to take the all in podcast with, you know, four big time investors, um, I don't know how many of them are billionaires, but I think everybody's at least worth hundreds of millions of dollars. They won't even take your ads because uh, they don't need it. It's uh, it's not even worth their time. So why would you do a podcast? Is it just uh, because of, is it just an ego play? Is it just you want to hear yourself talk? What's the value? And is, is there a business value beyond the revenue you can generate uh, from uh, selling advertising? And for me, I, I think this is... Um, this is illuminating. We could we could go deep into why it matters for you know venture capital and and um, other sectors, but I I think that the interesting part here applies much more broadly than that. Is part of the reason we have a podcast. Um, you know we are in a uh, we are knowledge workers. We um, we share information. Uh, the the kind of the new way of marketing is not necessarily to be out pitching, 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 but being generous with information and hoping that the people you want to be in business with will find you through that information. And I think the the trouble, like the kind of faulty assumption that you see in podcasts, which is probably why there's been four million of them. Uh, but you know, only 200,000 are updated on a regular basis. People come in with wrong expectations. They want it to do a job that it's, it, it can only do for so many people under so many conditions. If you saw Joe Rogan making money, you read the headlines, you said, everybody's doing this. Why don't I just start a podcast? And one day somebody will write me a big check uh, because my insights are so valuable and I'm so good at talking to people. Um, there's not a big business for that many people under those conditions. However, if you change your perspective on the channel and you say, yes, there is a side of it where you can make money as an entertainer, as a content creator. And if you can reach critical mass, you can earn a living with that as your primary revenue stream. Sure, there's probably a few thousand people in the world that are gonna be really successful at that. But for everybody else, this is like your email newsletter. This is like any other content marketing that you do. It's just kind of an interesting way to go about it. In it has its own requirements that are different from other channels, but the purpose doesn't really have to be different. And you know, I look at all the money that's been spent on branded 
podcasts where a, a company says, oh, we really got to get into this game. And they see it as something that's going to be a revenue driver and that's going to be ad supported. It's probably not. And it's very, very narrow, uh, your chances, even if you throw a lot of resources behind it, that it's ever going to pay back directly from, from ad sponsorship because of your reach. And so if you, if you let go of that, you control your costs in producing so that you can just simply create content that the people that you do business with may find interesting and important. And you put that out there for free. The secondary value that will come to you over the long term can be really, really meaningful but it's just not to be treated in the way that a typical, you know, you think about, oh, I'm going to start a TV show or, you know, the, all of the wealth and fame that you might presume comes with it. So I think that's, to me, what stands out from this article. It is worth reading. It's worth, inter it's interesting to see how really successful business people have used the channel in, in unique ways. But I think the lesson that it teaches has a lot more value well beyond that category. So um, I, uh, I don't know if there's any commentary on that, but, uh, if not, uh, we'll go right back to you, Giles, you're, you, we're just going to, uh, take turns here. Uh, tell us about, uh, the, the amazing shrinking share of audio, uh, that radio has. Well, um, I don't know if it's as amazing as perhaps you're suggesting it's, it's, a it's a continuation of a trend that we've been seeing for a long time. Um, and some you know, relatively recent data has been published showing again, the annual splits between radio and digital audio spend. Obviously we've got good estimates for podcasts as well. And we're seeing uh, traditional radio being forecast at just under 10.5 billion this year, going down to 10.33 next year and a sort of steady decline of losing about $150 million a year or so all the way through to 2028. So, you know, it's a, it's a steady drip and um, offsetting that you've got a steady and somewhat modest increase in digital audio spending across the same period, growing a little bit more quickly, perhaps around um, 400 million a year. Um, so round about, um, 9 billion by 2028. So getting very, very close to traditional by that time. Um, and I mean, you know, obviously we, we know this trend has been going on for a long time. We, we think that there's still both sides of the market actually to be played very well. The analogy, which you guys have certainly heard me use a lot is, is the iceberg analogy. And it was the same when, when TV started to shift to OTT is, yes, the traditional radio iceberg is melting, but people often don't look when below the surface of the water to see how big the, dam, the iceberg really is. And there is still an enormous amount of radio listening. And as I think we all know, people are still listening to over four hours of audio content every day across all channels. And radio has a substantial part of that. Um, but obviously, you know, the growth is coming from digital and specifically from podcasts. So I don't think anything is going to reverse that radio trend, but I do think there are opportunities both for smart marketers and for smart um you know, publishers on the on the radio side to to take advantage of it because um, there are less people focusing on it, and that typically means that there are opportunities to be had. Well, and there's um, there's a few things uh, that I think are are kind of stories behind the story here. One is if we're doing the math right, it seems like 2026. So within the next two years. If you add the revenues of podcast and streaming together they combining to equal digital audio should exceed traditional. So the digital is, um, is starting to replace the incumbent. And once you're on the other side of that hill, I think that it starts to move increasingly quickly. And so, you know, if you're, I, look, we could do a, a whole series about what we would do if we were in the shoes of the broadcasters. Um, and, you know, we work with lots of these groups and we know that they've got a tremendous challenge before them to try to monetize these signals, which are changing and to try to convert them to digital listeners within their ecosystem. It's getting harder and harder to do. Um, uh, oh, Giles is going to disagree with me. Uh, Giles, the math that I did was I took the 2028 projections for both 
and cut them in half and added them together to say, if we were at the center point between 2028 and today, and you had all of podcast, which will be around 3 billion perhaps, and you have all of um, streaming audio, would it then exceed where radio is going to be at, at nine ish billion. And I think that's when combined, they start to take over, but it's going to happen before 2028 that the pair of them will overtake. It just won't be streaming eclipses terrestrial. Do we okay. disagree? Um, the numbers that I'm looking at include all digital audio, and they suggest to me that even by 2028, the switchover will not have complete, completed. So we may be looking oh, at different sources. Um, I see. No, uh, Dan is providing misinformation in his projections, and that's what's happened here. So if we can't cut this out, then the I've heard misinformation is a risk in the show. media environment. It is, and fortunately, none of the brand safety tools even dare to try to track misinformation. Uh, but we're just going to self-disclose that right here. Uh, it happened. Okay, we're tracking and, it live in real and time. I'm sorry. I'm sorry about that. Idea. Yeah. Okay. Let's get back to the point. The point is, the business is changing. It's it's a question of when, not if. Is it going to be 2027, 2029? Digital is going to be the majority. And I was in this business when we started trying to package streaming with our over-the-air radio spots, and we'd put it in what's called a forced combo, where we would uh, say to the advertiser, if you want to be on this leading radio station, you have to also buy a spot on digital. And people are like, well, whoa, we don't, that doesn't have any value to us, right? I think it's going to be the reverse, right? So a lot of brands are going to see that they're being asked to pair their digital insertions with uh, terrestrial insertions. And, you know, then we're going to get into debates about the difference in demographics between those, those listeners. But I think the interesting thing for a marketer is to say, all right, is it worth my time to buy this thing on the way down? And, um, you know, we were in a conversation earlier, several of us with an industry luminary who I'm not going to quote directly, but what they said is, Hey, if you're not a performance marketer and you're buying audio, you should be buying terrestrial because the CPMs are lower. If it doesn't matter how it performs and what the outcome is, you might as well put all that money on terrestrial. Your reach will be great. Your CPMs will be low. If you need performance, there's different considerations, right? Um, but ultimately, I think we all know that it is a buyer's market, buyer's market in radio. And if you can buy it for a good price, there's still a price to be paid. And because there's less focus on it, it's not like your digital video channels where you're getting bid up to, you know, 50 some dollar CPMs. Uh, there's really a, um, a, an opportunity in it. And if you're the type of marketer that looks for opportunistic deals and transactions, and you're able to measure the consequences of those or not, radio is still probably a good buy, but I don't know that I'd wa be wanting to buy a, a, a signal right now if there was a, a broadcast license for sale. I don't know that I'd want to want to put all my eggs in that basket. Anybody else got anything on this one? No, but I think it uh, parlays into our next topic. Take it away, James. Very really well. So speaking of the transition from terrestrial to digital audio. What about digital audio to YouTube? So the YouTube CEO made some comments that he thinks that the Emmys should be embracing YouTube creators like Mr. Beast, um, maybe even Theo Vaughn, Joe Rogan. There's some podcast names in there. So the thought here is how far off do you think we are from podcast hosts or video creators actually being nominated and winning Emmys? Um, much like Netflix and Apple TV, they own the Oscars now. Like Netflix is always up there, best picture. I will say, rewind probably 15 years ago, there was no reality TV categories at the Emmys, yet it was a very popular category. Then all of a sudden it changed. Now you have, to this day, best reality show, best reality host, and that's what people are watching. So the award shows are gravitating towards where people are. So... Could we perhaps one day see Joe Rogan win best show up on stage at the Emmys or Mr. Beast win best production? I mean, I've read some articles and listened to some of these YouTubers. I think it's Mark Rober who does the science YouTubes. He puts out one a month. He loses money on them. Even all the ad money he makes, his production value is higher than the ad money and he makes money in other ways around it. But these are full on productions. These aren't just like an iPhone on a tripod. So what does everyone think about the, the video quality of uh, having these be award-winning 
video content or even podcasters. I don't like it. <laughs> I don't know. I'm sorry. Maybe I'm just too old, but uh, I don't want to see, uh, you know, TikTok stars uh, at the Emmys. Uh, best meme uh, parody uh, dance. I I'm good. I think we can just <laughs> let's limit to where we got right now. All right. So let's change the question. What about if now I know iHeart does one, but what if there was a more agnostic podcast awards that was put on by some independent group? I, I, I well, feel we like we have that's... those. I don't know that anybody cares about them, but we definitely pin prizes on each other and say, you're the coolest one. Uh, you know, the, the, the factors that go into those criteria, who knows, but um, you know, I guess in, in my view, it, this isn't just an audio thing, right? Like the world's trying to figure out how to deal with itself now that everybody's a broadcaster, everybody's a content company. Uh, so what do you do with, you know, 8 billion content manufacturers running around the globe? Um, I, I would imagine there'd be some value in drawing a line between scripted and non-scripted. Um, and maybe you know, like, when are we going to have an influencers award, uh, you know, that can kind of transcend platform, but also be really for that, um, personality that's just being themselves or some version of themselves, uh, without, you know, all the editing and production that would go into a, a, a scripted, a scripted series or, or film. Uh, I think that would be the way to do it. I think the hard thing is um, to figure out what, what difference does it make to an advertiser, but I guess it, it, it does tie back in that I think there's a lot of confusion um, about what line item and what department within a marketing organization should even be dealing with these different programs, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, you know, I remember um, years ago talking to Norm Pattis, may he rest in peace, uh, talking about taking trips to New York, meeting with the big ad hold, advertising hold co's and how he could, he, he was really working hard to get them to create a line item that included podcast and the, it didn't exist. They're like, where do you draw the money from? We don't know. Is it radio? Is it something else? We don't know how to classify these things, but I think there's, there's a great need for standardization in this business and across the media ecosystem. Um, and I think, I hope that the reward shows uh, follow suit from uh, the the advertisers. And I think the advertisers fundamentally need to have these lane lines drawn for them more clearly so that they can know how to organize to make decisions about everywhere that reaches potential customers. I'd like to see it start there. there to, Cause to me, they're at the top of the food chain. Well, there's parameters too. Like I know that Oscar makes sure that in order for your award to be, or your movie to be nominated, it has to be, in a theater for at least a week in 10 of the top 50 markets to qualify. So sometimes if you live in a larger city, you may see a Netflix movie in your local theater for one week on that end. So maybe there's some rules that we put in place to qualify some of these video content creators that will then spill over into audio and podcasting. I don't know. I'm kind of with Kyle. Like if that's what happens, like count me out. Yeah. What about I'm meme accounts? Out. What about meme accounts? Let's start doing that. Ladies and gentlemen, Shithead Steve with his first nomination. <laughs> <laughs>
Uh, and we, uh, we, we take our passion for the field and we, we really try to uh, lead the industry to new heights to reorganize itself. We want to see audio reimagined uh, so that it is sustainable for the future. That's, that's a big driver behind this program is that audio is the greatest canvas for the free and open exchange of ideas. And we want to be a part of that uh, through the stewardship of the brands that we touch. Uh, brand safety and suitability, of course, you know that's been a part of the fabric of this uh, conversation we have on this show for a long time. And as a direct result of that, there is a civility score in market that brands can use to help decide whether or not a program aligns with their values. If you're what we like to call a chief audio officer and you're looking to get best in market performance at maximum viable scale, please get in touch with us at oxfordroad.com. And if you love audio and you are strategic, relentless, and looking for a career change, give us a call. Uh, join our mission as fellow agents of influence. Flip us your resume through oxfordroad.com. And if you're working anywhere in the audio industry and are serious about this business, go to oxfordroad.com. It is easy to spell. Sign up for our free newsletter, The Influencer. It's edited by Kyle at OxfordRoad.com. The Influencer at OxfordRoad.com. Right now, mention you heard us at the Media Roundtable podcast. Thank you very much. All right, what do I get for that live read? Do we you you need to make it? Seven? Seven out of ten. How I can we do it better? I don't think a make good is going to be required, but... Could be a gray area. Fair yeah. enough. I didn't hear the you use it uh, and, and you right. should too. I didn't yeah. hear that. Um, I'd appreciate I'm using that. it right now. I'm doing the whole podcast thing. Well, for, uh, the influencer, at least, I, maybe I'm partial. You could have talked about you reading it every day, you're right, but it you're meets right. you on a weekly. I don't know. I'm going to give you a make good. Let's do it again. Have you ever okay. heard of any of these shows? <laughs> <laughs> these advertisers? Okay. Um, real time make it. That's story. a thing. I like real time make Real time. We're just going to do it <laughs> again. We're evolving right? the industry. <laughs> do it again. Right, here, right now. <laughs> I love it. Do you guys know that Eleven Labs is building an army of clones? No. Did you hear about this? No. Yeah, it's it's real. It's real. It's a real story. The Atlantic has an article that they estimate will take you 22 minutes to read it. So if you're a fast reader like Giles, you could probably read it in like 19 minutes. Uh, but the summary is this, uh, 11 Labs, um, who owns our lives, uh, one of the companies that owns our lives, uh, they pr are producing highly convincing AI voices, which we keep hearing about and talking about. Despite the excitement, Charlie Warzel of The Atlantic hesitates as his voice is replicated perfectly, albeit with an overly formal tone and inserted filler words. Uh, he found it a little eerie and that he could pay $22 for a creator account and upload recordings of himself for near perfection, uh, near perfect imitation. And this brings up some concerns. Uh, I mean, we know this has been coming, we've been talking about it, but we've kind of crossed over from like last year, we're talking about all the things that AI is starting to do. I feel like 2024, like this is when it's starting to actually make good on these promises in really profound ways. And I mean, the speed at which it's getting unrecognizable um, is crazy. So, you know, the real question here is, um, what do we think about this type of uh, technology being available to the market? Um, and what should we do as an industry, if anything, uh, to protect the interests of uh, the consumer the and, and all of the people who work in the business. What do you guys think about this one? Well, um, I was thinking about it primarily from the perspective of the advertiser to start with. Um, I think that obviously the, the, it's a very tricky area sort of being associated with, you know, hosts or content that you're not sure whether they're real or not um and may, many brands may not be comfortable you know in a space where there's ambiguity like that but you have i think emerging in audio not and all of the rest of the the digital space you know this general concept of walk, watermarking of content to identify you know content that is genuine people that are genuine and whilst there's a lot of discomfort around this right now 
I think that, you know, that's the history of technology in a way. Like, I think if you look back at the launch of any new technology, there's always a, a significant amount of concern and hesitation about potential risks, whether it's, you know, the internet or the automobile or electricity. Um, but I do think for marketers in audio, particularly, like there are interesting applications of this. And, and if, and I think it's more a question of when rather than if people become more accepting of this type of technology, um, could be very helpful for us. I mean, we do a lot of run and network buys, you know, programmatic buys. And one of the disadvantages of those is they lack authenticity, their boilerplate, you know, they can be uninspiring ads, but you could envisage a future where, you know, a run and network buy was voiced by the person who's hosting each individual show through the power of AI. And that could significantly improve performance for marketers, for example. So yes, you know, there are going to be difficult areas to navigate, but I think that there are going to be potentially really significant, interesting advantages here that we probably all will get used to and accept maybe sooner than we would think. I think there's a huge missed opportunity here. I need 11 labs to call my family members and wish them happy <laughs> birthday, uh, happy anniversary, what have you. I think this could be huge. I'm going to contact these guys tomorrow, actually. It's a big, big opportunity. Maybe show up in meetings for you. Well, yeah, we're working on that too, yeah. I'll play devil's advocate. Um, but I but I need to disclaim, like, of course, there's so many benefits to this that we need to take advantage of. And I don't believe in standing in the way of technology. I just believe that there need to be guardrails, right? And I think the most precious commodity we have in this industry and the thing that makes it unique is the currency of trust, the authenticity, the fact that it is generally not scripted, that you get familiar with the person whose voice you're consuming for sometimes more than an hour in a day, sometimes hours a week, and you care about what they have to say, you listen to what they have to say. And we know for a fact that people are more likely to respond to an ad message if they put their name on it and made a recommendation to their trusted listeners. Now, if you're cutting promos so that at some point they can localize, you know, Joe Rogan can read you the weather in your local market. Okay, fine. Like who cares? But if, if a personality that you trust is making a recommendation that they didn't authentically make, I think that's the red line for me. I think that's where we have to be vigilant and I think there's going to be a great dilution of the value of our most precious commodity if we're not thoughtful and have some guardrails because you could pervert it very quickly. You could broker, uh, you know, Spotify could come out tomorrow and say, hey, any of our hosts will recommend anything you want uh, and it's cheap um, for any price. You know, they could do that. Uh, and every ad's an endorsement again, except that it's not because they didn't necessarily have to go through the inefficiency of having to use a product, deal with it, and tell their story about it. That's where I think there should be a line drawn. Other than that, I'm pretty flexible. You guys support me in that line or you don't think we should have it? I support you on that line. I can get behind guidelines. What other guidelines do you think it might need, Giles? I don't know. <laughs> Maybe that's it then. That's fine. I just I say, mean, you know, but seriously, that may be it. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I, mean I think it's just, um, are, are you, are you representing something that was based on your personal credibility? Right. And that could be anything uh, in our world that's advertising. And so I'd start there. Do you, yeah. Um, it's a big topic. It's a big topic. We're going to have to keep talking about this um, oh. and we're going to have to, well, and we have to figure out like, should, does there need to be a, a sonic watermark? for the industry. And, you know, we may have a part to play in that just because we are so invested in, in preserving it. So should there be a, a sound that you play to indicate authenticity, or is there a sound you should have to play to indicate when you are using synthetic voices? I don't know. Open to your thoughts. Info at mediaroundtable.com. <laughs> Everyone here is perplexed. Um, well, we'd love your views. James, change the yes. subject for us, please. Tell us All about right. smart moms. Smart moms and smartphones. Uh, Edison Research came out with a pretty interesting study just all about moms and audio engagement. Um, but not only does audio engage, but also how they, what devices they use. So not, not surprising, but 98% of moms own a smartphone. 
96% use social media in the last week. But more interestingly is how, I didn't realize you can get this information, but they list 75% of moms listen through wireless headphones. Who knew that data was available? But as it pertains to audio, 78% of moms have listened to a podcast. That's up from 69% last year. So we're going up almost 10%. Um, and 43% of moms listened to a podcast last week, up from 32%. So we're at 11% more than that. What does all this mean? Maybe we should be focusing on mom and a lot of our advertising efforts. I know we have a lot of clients that focus on um, moms and parents, um, all the, all in the same there, but to show that they are using digital technology to engage with audio is definitely worth taking away. Now we'll add that our friend Pierre Bouvard has a companion story that came out about what women want. And he is saying not only digital audio, but moms have a, and parents have a, um, very strong affinity for AM FM radio, almost as high as Netflix and Hulu and watching their favorite shows online. So when they're at home watching Netflix, watching Apple TV, listening on their devices, when they're in the car, they're dialing into AM FM radio. So we're kind of covering all bases with women and moms. And so I'll open it to the group here, but what are our thoughts here? Like, are, are, are we on the right track? Do we think moms rule the world? We're coming off of Mother's Day. So the hand that rocks the cradle is the hand that rules the world. I just want that on the Moms record. rule the world. Yeah. 100%. I think that's a given. Um, I think in the podcast space, for sure, uh, you know, women in particular have, have really seen massive growth. Um, you know, when we started this thing, uh, you know, 11 years ago, uh, we killed ourselves trying to make female focused brands work. That's not the case anymore. Um, it's, we can, uh, there's plenty of opportunities out there. I know work, when I work with a female skewing brand, I literally will talk to my wife. Hey, what shows are you listening to now? And she'll give me the list. That's part of our, uh, it's the third factor of what we do when we do our initial uh, testing phase. Um, internal performance, CPM, details, and then what Becky Jelinek says, that's what we do. Well, I can talk about Mrs. Granger um, and, uh, and, and she's a mom um, and she listens to terrestrial radio uh, still. She is a loyal P1 listener of KFI uh, AM 640 and, uh, and listens every day. And, uh, we'll also listen to various podcasts. But one of the things I, I observe is, um, she doesn't want to flip around all the time, uh, and have to pick the next one and then pick the next one or, you know, preload them all. So I think there is something beneficial when you're multitasking, you're going from here to there, you're juggling a lot, um, to have something that just plays automatically. I think one of the things that, um, you know, one of the, the needs that I don't think streaming or podcasts have fully replaced in, uh, in radio, and it's going to have to before the full like changeover happens, is figuring out how to actually program streams that can play continuously all around some central themes or figures that people are going to be interested in, in listening to over a long period of time. So you're not having to switch it up every time, you know, you you hit an hour of content uh so but it's great we welcome the mothers uh we appreciate you for all of all that you've given and we are uh glad that you're in the podcast ecosystem and as marketers we're much happier uh to not have to dodge that question anymore about uh if uh, if we can reach you here uh so welcome aboard um james yes uh, are, are you gonna keep going here um no, I could. you're not. Kyle no, you might don't have go. to. Kyle is going to go. No, it's funny. Yeah, speaking of mothers, I'm, Ben Shapiro has a mother, and uh, he also has a new beard, and it, he looks pretty uh, pretty tough with this beard. Uh, and uh, earlier this month, he was at uh, the IAB Upfronts, uh, really making a case for conservative uh, podcasts, uh, talking about one of his biggest advertisers, Policy Genius, and how they found massive value on his podcast and the other podcasts on Daily Wire and conservative news as a whole. Um, and I think he did a great job of making a case for advertisers looking towards political content, despite the fact that it might be polarizing, might have, uh, you know, you might get some controversy. Um, but he also gave some, uh, some notes to advertisers that are looking at this. 
um, mentioned, you know, give the hosts uh, that flexibility so they can add humor and uh, add their own personality and creativity into their ad reads. Um, also warned uh, the uh, advertisers to stay away or don't pay as much attention to kind of the social media backlash that's been plaguing the industry since when Shapiro was in uh, elementary school. And then finally, I think all of this kind of underscores the need for the industry as a whole to partner with uh, you know, third party um, civility partners, uh, brand safety partners to, to make sure that, you know, to, to make sure that you're not staying away from genres and, and podcast types just because they might look bad on a piece of paper. Yeah, and I think um, listening to Ben, um, Dan and myself and some of our Oxford Road feed people were actually in New York for the Ivy Upfront. So watching Ben on stage along with Daily Wire, uh, we're talking all about what you just mentioned, Kyle. And I think it's interesting and it kind of was eye-opening as right now, you know, people buy most brands buy the shows individually. They'll buy Ben Shapiro, they'll buy this show, they'll buy that show. And so we were kind of toying around with the idea of what if we just bought the mirror image or presented the mirror image of all these shows to our clients and say, listen, if you're hesitant about buying something that might be a little bit right left leaning, let's put the mirror up and go find the equivalent all the way to the left. And let's work that into one big package. So that way you're not seen as taking any sides. You're just trying to sell your product to anyone who's listening across the aisle on both sides. So we are toying with that, especially with the election coming up um, in just a few months here. So Q3 is going to be very interesting in the political and talk, the news talk space. So I think by building out an equal opportunity podcast gift wrap box of, uh, of shows that, that includes all of these different differing personalities, it may actually make a safer zone for our brands and our clients to play in. So, so much of my career was shaped working with Bill Handel, the um, morning drive host in LA, and he would refer to himself as an equal opportunity offender. Uh, he'd just basically be like, I'm going to offend everyone on all sides of the spectrum. <clears throat> and through that, I think, uh, was his power in that you couldn't pigeonhole him as being a partisan. And so if you were upset with something he said, it's okay, because you knew he was going to give it back to somebody else. Um we did talk to Ben about this and um, you know, it's been interesting. Some of the people we get to have the brand safety conversation with over the years. Um, and I think, um, I think at this stage, people are no longer making the argument that there doesn't need to be any accountability. I think everybody's kind of saying like, okay, yeah, advertisers need to have some sort of nutrition or label or some sort of indicator of what them, they're getting themselves into what, but here's the, the piece that, he's really focused on is this diversification um, angle of saying, Hey, look, if you, as long as you buy left and right of center, you're okay. And is that, is that thesis true? Is that actually um, a winning argument? And is it an effective argument? I think are my questions. And I, and when I think about the brands that we work with, the ones that we've had conversations with over the years, I'd say my point of view, and I'm interested if you guys see it differently, uh, but I, I, I feel like the consensus is you've got a certain percentage of the market that is never going to be comfortable advertising conservative. I don't know that I've ever had a no liberal dictate or a no left dictate, but I've certainly seen a lot of no right wing dictates. And I think for, for folks that provide that kind of a, a directive, I think you're going to have a hard time explaining to them that, no, it's okay, because we also have uh, Pod Save America on the plan. I think there may be 20% of the market that that is compelling, who really is not ideologically driven. They just don't want to feel like they're picking on one side. And so I think there could be some that that is a valuable uh, way of looking at it. I also think it's a little bit more fair if you're going to open up, if you're going to widen out from just pure news, or you're going to even go into the genre at all, that you're willing to play on both sides of it so that you're not getting too ideological with your audience. Um, so I can see the logic, but I don't think it plays broadly. And I um, look, we've been clear with Ben, we've been clear with everybody in the market. What we like about civility score is that it makes no distinction for what side of the fence you're on politically. It's 100% based on how you treat people. And the problem that brands have 
I don't believe my personal view working on this for four years. I, I don't actually think a marketer's biggest problem is that they sponsor a certain ideology so much as the individual who is expressing that ideology and somebody that attacks other people to make their argument is going to get counterattacked and the brand gets caught in the middle and the brands need to get out of the culture war. They don't need to get sucked into that. And so if you go for civility, you kind of get the best of both worlds. You can advertise where you want around topics that are interesting to people and not have to worry about the backlash that's going to come and get you. But if you just want to have an argument for the whoever complains that will we also sponsor people on the other side, I don't know how far that's going to go. What do you guys think? What do you guys... Because you're working in the field, you're having to have these conversations. I think that it opens the conversation. So if you didn't have a comparison or a big box that included everyone from both sides, you're probably never going to get something bought in. However, if you open the conversation and say, here's our recommendation for you in this box, and let me show you where everyone sits in it, I think then you can allow the client to say, okay, I'm in on this. However, can we just make the box a little smaller? Can we shift it this way a little bit, it kind of opens that conversation versus like, no, I'm not doing any conservative talk. It, it yeah, allows I, them to see the scores. I, I think by having that measurement, um, people are a little bit more open to playing both sides because, um, you know, obviously they don't want to go too far extreme on either way, but having that balance and making sure that they're not overstepping too far either way. Um, when you have a measurement uh, to say like how far actually you're going, um, it's been extremely helpful uh, as we as I'm kind of walking through this with people, especially during an election season where people are open to this, they know listeners are there, and we know that this content can actually work from a performance standpoint. So you feel like Kyle, in the applications you're seeing, it's really about how far they go to the extreme. Yes, absolutely. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, but and we being able see, to quantify that has been the game changer. Yeah. Well, one of, one of the interesting things about the media bias chart, which, you know, came out of their, their work in podcast came out of Vanessa coming on this program. And, and when they started doing this for podcasts, we started looking at the correlation between the Y axis and the X axis, because on the media bias chart, political bias, it's not about how nice you are or anything else. It's about, uh, you know, where are your positions from the center? And there was a correlation that the further out you were politically, the lower you typically were. There was a direct correlation to the reliability and their reliability score also factored in things like ad hominem attack. So in fact, whether you're looking at extreme or whether you're looking at quality of speech or responsibility of speech, they actually generally move in the same direction. And so when you measure one, you kind of get the other. Uh, but it's interesting to hear that you think that the market's going to be receptive to that. I, um, I, I've been, I think, I, I've thought it would work for some, but I, but I didn't realize that it might have legs uh, to go broader. Um, Giles, we're running out of time. Uh, and fortunately, we've landed on our final story about our friends at Spotify. Um, care to take us home? Yes, and our friends at Spotify um, have removed the price floors from the uh, span network, which could have a pretty big impact for some of their um, some of their clients hosting on megaphone um, because the megaphone um, publishers and content creators like they may well have relationships with programmatic partners. And those um, relationships may offer them more control and visibility into their um, and more potential profit with it, with their inventory. But because that programmatic inventory sits below span in the waterfall, there's a big risk that that inventory is going to get sucked up um, in span or they are going to just lose exposure to to buyers in this way because of the potentially increased demand for span inventory. So it's not a great move from Spotify if you are hosting on Megaphone. Um, it's, you know, another move of, a, you know, a, the gorilla in the space who's lo looking to exert more and more control. If you are a Megaphone hoster, um, if you're hosting on Megaphone, you might be frustrated that you know, Spotify's recent announcement that they are not re-upping their um, IAB certification. 
and you know you might want your um, ho shows hosted on Megaphone to have that certification. So, it, you know, it's just another move from Spotify that sort of has them taking more control of the ecosystem and um, potentially, you know, annoying the the people that currently are, are collaborating with them. So it'd be really interesting to see how this one plays out. So so Giles, I had to read this one a couple times when it came through. So I'm going to just ask you to dumb down some of it by giving us a, a bit of a use case. If I'm an advertiser, yeah, how does this change how a bill becomes a law for me? Or what is the, is there an I, opportunity or a threat for me? I think, you know, I think we could get into the publisher side, but that's really not our main concern right now. It's the advertisers, right? So what's well, the impact? I mean, I think the impact is bigger on the publisher side for sure, which is really you know, the most of the thrust of the story. But the, the removal of the price floor on spam, um, you know, does potentially mean that at least initially there could be, uh, you know, a good value inventory to be had there through spam uh, and, and, you know, opportunistic pricing. Again, at least in the short term, it might mean that overall, you know, prices end up going up. They haven't made it clear as to whether they're going to take... Um, you know, uh, bids or variable pricing in there. So so it is a bit ambiguous still, but it could mean that there are advantageous opportunities for, for advertisers in the short term, you know, offsetting some of that pain for the publishers. There's two trains of thought here. One is the inventory is going to be sold by someone, whether it's programmatic or spam or or, or the, the show itself. But I guess taking out the, the, uh, the floor of it kind of allows that it takes the host and the producers out of it but maybe this is a case for the save the live reads if they can bake the content into the show that's theirs and they can own it um and then if they open up the ad breaks for spotify to come in that's that's something interesting there but to my my pov is that this is you're still going to have two or three mid rolls and they're still going to be in there so someone along the line is probably going to be benefiting from it but maybe what this all means is that the actual content creator is on the short end of the stick but they can probably do some things to make up for it by baking in their ads or cutting side deals here here well mm -hmm. let me just recap what i think i'm hearing from you guys from this conversation i'll give you the t l d l right do we ever use that okay <laughs> international is a big deal in audio uh, and it's getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And the tools are starting to recognize that uh, venture capitalists are using podcasts to do more than just generate revenue. They're using it as a marketing tool. And you can too, even if you're not a venture capitalist. Uh, Radio is not doing so well terrestrial wise, but that's an opportunity for brands. YouTube influencers may get Emmys one day. James really wants to see Mr. Beast take one home. Kyle and I feel differently. Um, voice clones are going to steal your identity and you may have a podcast that you never listened to. We at the media round table and at Oxford road believe that you should have to disclose if you're making a recommendation, uh, that you didn't actually make, uh, in real time. Uh, smart mom summer is upon us, uh, as the mothers are, uh, descending upon the, the channel, um, and opening up a new demographic uh, that we should be speaking to in our marketing and in our ads in a custom way. Uh, ben Shapiro and the team at the Daily Wire are saying you can buy the right as long as you buy the left too. include us, make it fair. We're going to see how the market responds to that. Spotify uh, making up the rules because they are the tallest poppy and uh, they get to do that sort of thing. We're going to have a lot more conversation about the kind of macro theme nested within that, which is about some of these giants. You know, we have our own version of Fang in audio, and they kind of are setting a lot of standards for the industry, but there's no cohesion and it's babble and confusion everywhere. But we're going to clean all that up for you. That's why we do this podcast to make sense of the things that don't make sense. And we thank you all for joining us here on the Media Roundtable podcast. It is brought to you by Oxford Road, where we want you to succeed in audio and to use your influence for good. As members of the marketing community, we have the power to advance voices that don't just entertain, but edify and to build bridges across our differences. If you're a marketer and you want to align your brand values with extraordinary business outcomes, reach out to our agency, Oxford Road, by going to oxfordroad.com and subscribe to our weekly newsletter 
letter that Kyle just agonizes over every week. It's called the influencer. Give us your feedback. If you don't like what we're doing or you do like what we're doing, don't wait to run into me at a conference where I get most of our feedback. Email us info at mediaroundtable.com. Listen to Ad Infinitum. We don't just produce this podcast. We also produce the leading podcast that is focused on audio creative. If you're really in the weeds on this business, you're going to love this show where Stu breaks down with industry experts the what's actually behind the ads that you're hearing and talks about the strategy. Special thanks to Bianca, Kyle, Haley, Ezra, Mary Jane, Everett, Neil, Giles, James. Did I miss anyone? Podcast One, as always, influence responsibly. <laughs> <laughs>